get started. How you doing? Good. Okay. How did it go yesterday, Ali? Good? Good. Oh, that's right. All right. Good. Glad to hear. Got your homework. Yeah, thanks. Hey, how are you? Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, remember you have a new homework out. Homework six is out now. It was out yesterday, but it's uploaded to Canvas. So you'll be able to access it now. And the project is also out. So you know what, let me access those. Uh, see if I can find them. Okay. What's a good way to get to that? Maybe here, here, and extra credit project. 
Okay, so the extra credit project is here, right? Uh, what it says is you'll have to the end of the semester to do it. So it'll be due on the last class, which is December 5th at the start of class. And you'll get 5% toward your final grade, your total final grade. So if you got an 85 total cumulative in the course, 85%, giving you like a B, then you would get uh, extra 5% if you complete this, if you complete it well, right? So then you could get up to 90%, you can get an A, right? So it's pretty valuable. It'll give you 5% towards your final grade in total. And basically what you have to do is recreate results and findings from a research paper. So you can read through this, but uh, basically you're gonna wanna find a research paper of your choice related to electromagnetics and publish in a reputable journal. Read the paper thoroughly, rederive any mathematical results or findings in the paper, recreate any simulation results, uh, in the paper, and if you need access to simulation software to do that uh, recreation of the simulations, you want to try to obtain either a trial, a temporary trial license from the vendor. If you can't, if you're unsuccessful in doing that, which most of them allow you to have, then let me know and I'll try to set you up access with any software that we have in the department. We do have HFSS in the department for any students. I know that. Okay. Um, and there also might be some learning curve to how to use the software. So you should start this now if you want to do it, right? And uh, write up a report of your recreation of your results and understanding of the material. You should be very clear about what you are writing. Think of another person trying to take your paper and recreate the results just as you have done with theirs. So you need to be clear, concise, and you need to be direct with uh, what you're writing in your paper. So it's kind of giving you practice on how to write a research paper. But you should be able to... Whoever reads your paper should be able to take it and reproduce the results that you're claiming you have found in your paper, right? Uh, okay. And have you included all the necessary information for re recreation of the results? Is there any ambiguities or conventions you have not defined? Is there any key information that one would need to recreate the results of your report that you have left out? So forth, right? So, um, so yeah. So, I mean, you get to pick a paper of your choice. So don't pick something too crazy, right? Find something kind of a, maybe a little, little simpler, but it has to be electromagnetics related. You can look in the IEEE transactions on antennas and propagation, that's probably a good place, or the IEEE uh, antennas and wireless propagation letters, or wherever you want to find a paper, but it has to have some, you have to use your knowledge that you've gained in this course to understand the paper, right? Okay, good. All right, so that's the project, and your homework number six is out as well. Any questions on that? Uh, okay, good. So there were a couple of things. Okay, so I fixed the PowerPoint. I needed to update my iPad for some reason. The fonts weren't working on any of the lectures, so I then realized it was the software on the iPad. So I updated it and it works now. So there are a few things in the last lecture that I want to clarify. So here we have this gamma hat unit vector. This is something that we said, okay, you can kind of understand it by looking at the coordinate variables and sort of visualizing it in your head. But really where this comes from is it's the X hat unit vector uh, expressed in terms of theta hat and phi hat. So this, this uh, current density is in the X hat direction. And we know by uh, the magnetic vector potential that A should be in the same direction as J, right? And then we know that E is related to A. If we're in the far field, we are pretty much in the far field for an infinitesimal dipole right when we leave the dipole, right? To, you know, maybe landed by five away. Um, then you only have transverse components, right? So here, look at this one. This electric field due to the vertical electric dipole has a sine theta pattern, radiation pattern, and it has theta hat unit vector. So we expect that the, uh, the uh, direction, the polarization of the electric field to follow the theta hat unit vector. All right. So here we have the uh, X hat directed dipole. So we would expect that the polarization should be at least uh, directed along X, hats, uh, X hat, right? So we have gamma hat here. If we express it in terms of theta hat and phi hat, if you go back to lecture one and you look at the transformation matrix, which takes you from uh, or spherical coordinates to rectangular coordinates, you'll see this is the exact expression to express X hat in terms of theta hat and phi hat. So it's the first row of that matrix, first row, which is the X hat row, uh, but it doesn't include the R hat term, right? Because we want transverse components only for the polarization, for the direction of the electric field. 
So it removes the radial component. So you can visualize it like that, right? That's where it comes from. Okay. The other thing I wanted to clarify is the uniqueness theorem. So if you looked at your homework, you're going to have to rederive all this yourself. But the strategy for the uniqueness theorem was, uh, so let me go back over it really quickly, briefly. We have two fields that we suppose are solutions to the same set of Maxwell's equations for the same sources, right? We have EAHA and EBHB. If it is that these, that, that, uh, these both these sets of fields, EA and EB and or sorry, EAHA and EBHB, both uh, arise from the sources J I and M I, then that means that the solution of Maxwell's equation is not unique, right? We should get one set of fields for um, a given set of sources for Maxwell's equations. Okay, so if EA and HA satisfy Maxwell's equations for the sources M I and J I, and EB and HB satisfy Maxwell's equations for the sources M I and J I, then we have these two sets of equations, right? All right, if we subtract the two, we can remove the common sources and we have the negative curl of EA minus EB, J omega mu, HA minus HB. So we subtract this equation from that one and this one from that one. We can note that EA minus EB is called the difference field. So it's the difference in EA and EB. Obviously we want that difference to be zero because then that means EA and EB are identical. And that means that you get a unique solution to Maxwell's equations for a given set of sources, MI and JI. All right, so H, A, and H, B, we can call delta H, and then we have J omega mu H, right? Which is very similar to the original Maxwell equation, J omega mu H, but now it's J omega mu delta H. So what we're gonna call the right-hand side is, this is going to be a sort of a displacement current, but we'll call it the total magnetic current, all right? Same thing with Ampere's law, we have the curl of delta H, we have sigma plus J omega epsilon into delta E, and we're gonna call this the total current J total, all right? Okay. So the big idea was here. We have, we're gonna use the conservation of energy equation, which we know must hold, right? So we have two, two expressions, two terms have to equal to zero. The first term here is E cross H conjugate integrated over the surface, right? It's the flux of power leaving the volume. And here is the power in the volume, which is E dotted with J and H dotted with M supplied by the sources, right? Okay, so let's assume first that this first term is zero, all right? Both these terms have to be zero or their sum has to be zero in order to satisfy this theorem. But if we assume first that this term is zero, then we need this second term to be zero. If the first term is zero, the second one must be zero in order to add to zero. If this term is zero, so this term has to be zero, right? All right, what we're gonna show is this term is equal to zero only when delta E and delta H is equal to zero which is what we want. That means the fields are unique, right? That means there's no difference in the two solutions for a given set, set of sources. All right, so first we have to find out what uh, sigma plus J omega epsilon. Okay, so J total we had on the last slide, which is sigma plus J omega epsilon. We have to conjugate everything times delta E, right? And then M total was J omega mu delta H. So let's find out what sig sigma plus J omega epsilon conjugate is. Uh, all right, so we know epsilon is a complex number, epsilon prime minus J epsilon double prime. And we can then uh, foil out or distribute this J omega, and we get the following term, sigma plus omega epsilon double prime minus J omega epsilon prime in complex notation. We can do the same thing with J omega mu. We end up with omega mu double prime plus J omega mu prime. These two terms, sigma plus J omega epsilon conjugate and J omega mu are in this integral, right? All right, if you take this expression now and uh, we have delta E dotted with delta E conjugate, that's magnitude of delta E squared. And then we have sigma plus J omega epsilon conjugate, which we know is these two terms, right? And we have J omega mu, which is these two terms and delta H conjugate because we have delta H dotted with delta, delta H, or sorry, delta H conjugate dotted with delta H. All right, well, let's split this into real and imaginary parts. And then we substitute in sigma plus J omega epsilon as this and, uh, we substitute in J omega mu as this expression here. And what we end up with is an expression which can only be zero if delta E and delta H are zero. Why? Because these expressions, sigma plus omega epsilon double prime and omega mu double prime are positive for dissipative media. So we're assuming that the medium has uh, losses, slightly lossy. 
The theorem can hold for lossless cases by taking the limit as the loss goes to zero. But for media which have some loss, this integral here is zero only when delta E equal to delta H equal to zero. All right? If there were no loss, then this term wouldn't have to be zero. For, for example, sigma plus omega epsilon double prime into delta E conjugate, or sorry, delta magnitude delta E squared, could be zero when sigma and epsilon double prime are zero, right? Then that doesn't necessarily mean that delta E is magnitude delta E squared is zero. But if there are losses, if there are slight losses, if sigma is non-zero, epsilon double prime is non-zero, then the only way for this integral to be zero is if delta E magnitude squared is zero, which implies that delta E is zero. That's the idea. Okay, hold that in your mind, that this term, the second term here, is zero when delta E and delta H are zero, if there's slight dissipative losses. So I added this big idea up here. Both terms need to be zero to satisfy the conservation theorem, right? The second term was shown to be zero if delta E and delta H equal to zero in dissipative media, all right? So that's what we have. We have now delta E and delta H equal to zero. Give us the, the second term equal to zero. All right, now we just have to show that if we assume that delta E and delta H are zero, then the first term is also zero, and then we're good, right? Then they're both zero. All right, so we have to use the fact that delta E and delta H is zero in order to show that the first term is zero. So the only thing left now to do is show this first term is zero under those assumptions. And we use this sort of a back cab uh, a vector identity here in order to rewrite that integral as delta E cross delta H conjugate dotted with NDA. This is surface integral over the surface bounding the volume V. And it's a uh, integral of sort of the difference flux. Well, by this equality from this identity, that's also equal to N cross delta E dotted with delta H dA and delta H cross with N hat dotted with delta E and DA, yeah? Okay, so we have three different ways to make this zero because these are all equal. All right, so we already showed on the previous slide that delta E delta H equal to zero. Thus, this integral is zero when either delta E is zero, if we pick delta E equal to zero, then this whole term goes to zero, right? If we pick delta H go to zero, this whole term goes to zero, or if we pick delta E and delta H equal to zero, then this term goes to zero. So does everybody see that? Okay, there are three different options. Option one, either delta E is zero, which we have as one of our conditions, over the whole surface, because then uh, this whole integral goes to zero, regardless of H, or, Delta H is equal to zero over the whole surface because this whole term then goes to zero over this whole surface, regardless of E, delta E. Or we have delta E equal to zero over part of the surface and delta H over the remaining part. Then the first term goes, then this, this identity or this inequality goes to zero. So we can write that in the following way. A field E and H is unique when N cross E is specified on S. N cross E is specified on S then we're saying that n cross delta e is equal to zero, right? This results from the exact specification of the tangential components of e. So the main takeaway of the theorem is, if I know the tangential components of e over the whole surface bounding some volume of which I'm trying to satisfy Maxwell's equations, then uh, the solution is unique. The solution is only unique. Another way to think of it is the solution is only unique when I also specify the tangential components of E over some surface bounding the volume, the solution domain, yeah? Okay, that surface can go out to infinity if I want. And since I know the field's decay is one over R, then the tangential E is zero out there, I specified it. Or I can apply boundary conditions on some kind of exterior surface of my domain. And those boundary conditions give a prescription for E, tangential E. I only need tangential E, that's another takeaway from this. I don't need the normal component. So your solution is unique when you solve Maxwell's equations and you know the tangential components, tangential only on the surface, or you apply boundary conditions, right? Because the boundary conditions are in general, uh, some of them are in terms of tangential E. Okay, or you could do tangential H on the whole surface or partial part E and part H on the rest of it. All right, good. 
you're going to write that all up for your homework and dig into your own understanding of it, right? It's in the book. All right, let's get going to our material from today. All right, now we're going to get into another theorem, reciprocity theorem. This whole chapter is on theorems in electromagnetic theory. Um, but theorems give you the power to solve problems in a, in a more clever way. So here, reciprocity, what is it? Consider two sets of sources now, J1 and M1, and J2 and M2. J1 and M1 radiate the fields E1 and H1, and J2 and M2 radiate the fields E2 and H2 in the same linear isotropic medium. All right, so maybe we need a picture, right? Here, so we have some medium here. We have J1, M1. We have uh, J2 and M2. Okay, they're in the same medium. J1 and M1 radiate the fields E1, H1. J2, M2 radiate the fields E2 and H2. But the medium that they exist in is uh, the same linear isotropic medium. Both fields must satisfy Maxwell equations, yeah? Whenever you have sources specified, then the fields must, must satisfy Maxwell equations. So we have M1 and J1 radiate E1 and H1. So that should satisfy a set of Maxwell equations. We have E2 or M2 and J2. They should radiate fields E2 and H2 and therefore should satisfy their own set of Maxwell equations. All right. Okay, so here's, so uh, whenever I, also I put it here because whenever I read these when I was a student, I was like, why would you think of doing this operation? This is something that seems to come out of, in the book, they just list, okay, now do this step. Now do this step mathematically. But where did you come up with that idea? What was the motivation behind it? If I were to do a new derivation with, without a book to guide me, what would, I, what would I think of? How would I think of how to do the next step? You know, what would be motivating? What would be uh, some way to understand what, why they're doing this. So, okay, in the book, they say they dot multiply Faraday's law for the first sources by H2 and Ampere's law for the second sources by E1. That's what they say in the book, but why? Okay, the idea is we're trying to form expressions with the fields of system one reacting, reacting. We're gonna learn what reacting is soon with the sources of system two, right? So if I have, if I have this set of Max equations and I want to find what uh, I want to find the reaction because the reaction is going to be some symmetric uh, quantity. I want to find the reaction of fields versus sources. A reaction is the integral of a field and a source, right? So here I have M1 and I want to find this quantity H2 M1. So I want the sources from the second set of Maxwell's equations, the fields from the second sources to react with the sources of the first set of fields. So that's the idea, all right? This quantity turns out to be some symmetric product or a symmetric quantity. All right, so we take H2 and we dot it. So this is wrong, right? This should be H2. H2 dot with the curl of E1 minus H2 dot with M1 minus J omega mu H1 dot with H2. Okay, and we do the same thing with the, uh, with the other one. We do E1 dotted with curl of H2. Uh, equals to E1 dotted with J2 plus J omega epsilon E1 dotted with E2. All right, good. Now subtract the two results. Okay, why would we want to subtract the two results? Let's see. E1 dotted with the curl of H2 minus H2 dotted with the curl of E1. So we want to subtract the left-hand sides and then we subtract the right-hand sides. We get E1 dotted with J2 plus H2 dotted with M1 J omega epsilon E1 dotted with E2 and J omega mu, ah, oh man. So H1 dotted with H2. Okay. The reason why we wanted to do that is because of this, if we can utilize this identity here, the divergence of A cross with B, which is equal to B dotted with the curl of A minus A dotted with the curl of B, we can write the above here as the divergence of some quantity here, which is gonna, uh, okay, so, so it, it kind of looks like, it's, it's not necessarily, I don't wanna say it's, it's a pointing vector or anything like that because there's no conjugate and it's two different fields, right? E1 and H2. But okay, let's, let's take it a step further. The divergence of H2 cross with E1, right? So the divergence of A cross with B. So we have 
B dotted with the curl of A here. B is E1 dotted with the curl of H2. So A is H2 minus H2, which is A dotted with the curl of E1, which is B. Okay, good. So then the divergence of A, we just identified as H2 and B, we identified as E1. So the divergence of H2 cross E1 is equal to minus the divergence of E1 cross H2 because I've you know, reversed the order of the cross product, which means you pull out a minus sign, fine. And then on the right, we have a bunch of reaction terms here, right? E1 dotted with J2, H2 dotted with M1, and then we're gonna have, these are gonna lead to uh, stored, stored energy, right? This is H2 again. All right, we're almost to something useful we can analyze. So we have to do the same thing with the other two equations. So what did we do here? We did this equation, we dotted it with H2, and then we did this equation, we dotted it with E1. Right? Now we're gonna do this equation and this equation, same thing. <sighs> All right, how about that? All right, in a similar manner, we dot multiply Ampere's law for the first source by E2 and Faraday's law for the second source by H1. All right, so we get, so what I want this not to be is like a, like a, a set of steps that, mathematical steps that you lose insight and you're just seeing, okay, we can do this, dot this equation, dot that equation, subtract them, but you lose the insight of what the, what the thinking process was doing that. Uh, but, but bear with me on the few steps and then we'll analyze the result. Then we can go back and start to understand why these steps were made, right? Okay, so don't, don't view this as something where I'm just doing all these mathematical operations. There's reasons behind it. So let's do the same thing to the other sources. H1 dotted with the curl of two, H1 dotted with M2, and J omega H2 dotted. Oh, why am I putting H2 again? Okay, so H1, yeah? All right. And E2 dotted with the curl of H1, E2 dotted with J1, and J omega epsilon. So what we're doing here is this, E2 dotted with, and up here, we're doing H1 dot with, right? All right, J omega epsilon E2 dot with E1. Now we subtract those two results and we have two results now. We use the same identity. Here's the analogous result from the last slide, right? So we did the same thing with the other two equations. We're trying to find symmetries in Maxwell's equations with respect to the sources and fields. So subtract this result with the final one. We never disrupt the equality when we subtract two different equalities, right? The equality holds. So we subtract this final result with the final one from the last slide, and we get what's called the Lorenz reciprocity theorem in differential form. So here's the main conclusion. Here's the result. We get minus the divergence of E1 cross with H2 minus E2 cross with H1. We know what divergence is, right? We have some volume, and we're going to add up all the flux leaving that volume through its surface bounding it, right? And, uh, okay, so... This quantity, which is hard to interpret, right? It's E2 and H1 and E1 and H2. But anyhow, this quantity is equal to quantities we can interpret. E1 dotted with J2, that's a uh, similar to dissipation, right? But this is E1 and E2, so we're mixing fields and sources. If this was E1 dotted with J1, then we know that would be dissipation, right? Because J1 could be sigma E1, and then that becomes sigma magnitude E squared, and that's a loss, right? So this is kind of like a loss, but this is actually called reaction. All right? So I'm trying to stress to you guys that this is more than a bunch of mathematics. These are very useful theorems. I think I have an example or so in the next slide of how you can use these, but there's a ton of ways that these, that these show up that uh, simplify your life. All right? H2 dot with M1, and then we have these two terms, E2, J1, H1, M2. So all of these are sources reacted with fields, but they're mixed, right? J2 and E1, M1, H2, E2, J1, M2, H1, yeah? All right, to understand what it tells us, let's write it in integral form. So take the volume integral of both sides and use a divergence theorem on the left half side, and we obtain the Lorentz reciprocity theorem in integral form, right? All right, so what this says, Negative, the integral over a surface bounding some volume V of E1 cross with H2 minus E2 cross H1 dotted with DS, a flux integral of these, these quantities, whatever these are, right? Is equal to the volume integral of all of those reaction terms. 
All right. Consider a source-free region for just to dissect this thing and understand it, yeah? Let's consider a source-free region. What happens there? In a source-free region, J2, M1, J1, and M2 are all zero. So the right-hand side is zero, yeah? So we have this theorem. This is a valid theorem that we've derived from reciprocity in a source-free region. What does it say? It says that the surface integral of this, these two quantities equal to zero, or that the divergence of E1 cross H2 minus E2 cross H1 equal to zero if we then uh, go back to differential form. And it says all fields in source-free regions must satisfy these criteria, all right? Just one way to check that you have um, you have the correct solutions, right? So that, that's one consequence. Every All fields in source-free regions must satisfy these two criteria if there were two different fields in that region. So somehow, maybe this little integral identity here will allow you to solve a problem that you couldn't before, right? Okay, consider a region within a sphere of infinite radius, all right? So let's look at, let's look at a little bit more. A sphere with infinite radius means that this term, the surface, of this goes out to infinity, these fields drop off as one over R, right? And the power, therefore, their product is one over R squared. If the sphere, the sphere S goes out to infinity, then the left-hand side goes to zero, all right? Assume that the fields are observed in the far field, ideally at infinity, basically, is what you're saying here. Then zero on the left side is equal to this quantity on the right-hand side. And this, it, okay, so then what we do is we, throw some of these terms to the other side, the negative ones we throw to the other side. Or, or sorry, we keep E1, J2 on this side. We keep H1. So we keep E1 and H1 and the source is J2 and M2 on one side. And then on the other side, we have E2, H2, the fields from two and the sources from one. This is the most useful form of reciprocity that, that you'll use in your problem solving. All right, this is the most useful form. We'll show some examples of the usefulness of this form on the next slide. This is probably what you've seen before if you've seen reciprocity theorems. All right. So what does this tell us, right? It says there's an equality. Whenever there's an equal sign, we know that we have some powerful statement relating quantities on either side. So we have E1 and H1, and we have J2 and M2. And then we have here E2, H2, and J1, M1. You've probably heard of reciprocity in a loose, loose uh, English definition as, if I exchange source and observer, then I get the same result right? So if I have a source and I have a measuring dipole here or something, or an observer, observer, I calculate the field at this point. If I interchange these positions in the same linear isotropic medium, and now this is the source and this is the observer, I should get the same result, right? Yeah, so you have some source and observation, you have to exchange source and observer, and, and the, the source doesn't change when you do that. And the medium has to be the same. Yeah, you wouldn't expect that. This equation tells it to you, right? Let's say I exchange indices one with indices two, right? Then E1 goes to E2, J2 goes to J1, H1 goes to H2, and M2 goes to M1, and I get the exact same expression, which tells me I can exchange source and field or observation, and I get the same result. It's a symmetric result. That's the reciprocity that you're probably used to. So let's see how it's useful. Let us assume that source two consists of only an ideal electric dipole of vector length P. So we have, uh, all right, so what do we have here? So here's two sets of sources, J1 and M1 in volume V1 and J2 and M2 in volume V2. These two volume are the same media, right? That's one critical uh, restriction. Now, here's the reciprocity theorem we derived on the last slide. Let's say that sources two are only electric sources and they're from an electric dipole, a vector length P. Then uh, source two is J2, right? So we have the left-hand side is equal to this, but we know J2. J2 is now going to be delta R minus RP, where the, the position vector of point P, where the dipole exists, dotted with, or not dotted with, but times P. The vector notation is here. So the delta function says it's a point source, but it's a directed point source. It's a dipole, infinitesimal dipole, and it has vector length P, all right? Good, so the right-hand side becomes E1 dotted with that dipole. All right, well, what are we doing here? We're integrating a delta function, essentially, over a 
a uh, very small region here, right? So if we integrate that delta function, then what we get is the uh, argument, right? Which is E1 dotted with P at the point P, XP, YP, ZP, or RP, right? All right, good. So we have E1 dot with P is equal to the volume integral of the left-hand side that we had originally. All right, we can calculate the radiated, we can, cal we can calculate the fields radiated from sources one by evaluating the integral using known sources. We can calculate the fields radiated by or from sources one by evaluating the integral using known sources, J1 and M1, and a known ideal dipole fields, E2 and H2. Okay, what am I saying? I'm going to use this expression here to calculate the fields radiated by sources one, which is J1 and M1, by evaluating this integral using the known fields, E2 and H2. Yeah? Why? Because we know what sources two are. Sources two is just an electric dipole. And last lecture, we calculated what E and H is due to an electric dipole. So we kind of use the dipole as a probe. We'll see how that leads to intended measurements. Well, E2 and H2, we know in closed form, right? E2 and H2, we know because it comes from a dipole, ideal dipole. Thus, if we know sources J1 and M1, we can find the fields radiated by those sources by evaluating this integral. So we take the dot product of the known E2 from the dipole into J1. And remember, this is over there, over the uh, location of J1. J1 might be some small finite support region of current. And if I know the dipole field, so I have some current here, right? And then over here, I have a dipole. If I know the fields radiated by this dipole, then all I have to do is evaluate those fields over the, do the domain of, of J1 sources. And I can find the fields radiated by that J1 sources anywhere else by just integrating over the source region with a dipole known field at some other location. It will be at this RP, right? And H2 dot with M1. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand? The sources, no, J1 and M1 can be different than J2, M2. But if you exchange the, uh, if you exchange the, what we're doing here, J1 observed field e, E1, right? And then I have M1 observed and then H1 observed. If that then exchange J1 over here and M1 over here, and I observe E2 and H2 up here, then that's kind of what I was saying with the symmetry. The source had to be the same in that sense. This is different. We have two sets of sources and two sets of fields, right? So this integral here always has to hold this equality, right? Reciprocity. Let's say I know my source is J2 and M2. M2 is zero. J2 is some small current element. Then I know the fields radiated by that current element, E2, H2. Yeah? And I can use this equality to find what uh, E1 is at this point, XP, YP, ZP, by calculating the, uh, and this E1 is radiated by J1 and M1, right? I can calculate E1 at some distant point by using the known fields E2 and H2, which are radiated by the dipole. I can do that integral, right? Okay, let me draw a picture, maybe it's better. So uh, here's J2, J1, M1, and J2, M2, right? Let's say J1 is only, no, it's J2, sorry, hold on. Let's say J2, is only electric dipole and there's no M2, right? I know that fields radiated by uh, J2 are E2 and H2, right? Okay, I wanna find the fields radiated by this J1 and this M1 here, right? I wanna find them over here. So this is the point P, for example, uh, RP. This is the point RP. This point here. Yeah, where J2 is. I want to find the fields radiated by J1 and M1 at this point where J2 is at. Well, I can use this integral, right? So I know, I know, I want to find this quantity here, E1, right? Radiated by 
J1 and M1. Well, I know what uh, E2 and H2 are. E2 and H2 are known analytically from this dipole. And I know what the dipole strength is, P. So I just have to evaluate this integral, right? I know E2, I know J1, I know H2, I know M1. And I only have to integrate over this volume here. I have to calculate this integral. And I can calculate the field outside of this volume at this point here, radiated by these sources, by using this trick. Yeah, by using the identity. Okay, fine. So this is the fields H and E from the dipole, right? So we know what these fields are. We calculated them in the last lecture. So we can do this for different orientations of P, the ideal dipole, which was source J2, uh, which is acting as a field probe. So how is this used in practice? This is how we do antenna measurements in general, right? We have some current here, some antenna, right? There's an antenna sitting at the origin of some coordinate system, yeah? This antenna is radiating. We want to measure its radiation power, a radiation pattern, radiated fields over a surface S bounding that antenna at some distance R, at a constant distance R. I want to measure the radiated field over a sphere of radius R surrounding that antenna, do a pattern measurement. All right, how do I do that? Well, I take a little probe. I use reciprocity. I take a little probe, which is a small dipole or some kind of antenna with known fields, right? And I uh, first I orient that linearly polarized antenna in one way. I measure the radiation pattern, and I come back and rotate the dipole and do it again. But let's say we're considering first the one of the polarizations, E theta. So I want it to be tangent to the sphere. And this probe, I know the current of the probe, so that would be P, right? And I know the fields radiated by the probe, which are uh, E2 and H2, right? And I want to find the field radiated by the sources J1 and M1, which are the sources on the antenna under test, at the point on the sphere. I want to measure E1. So I measure, so I have to calculate this integral, right? I need to calculate this, this integral, basically. I have to integrate over the sources. You could do that. Um, you could do that if you knew the current density on the on the antenna. Okay, but all right. So real quick, one thing. Uh, normally, we do not uh, take a probe and scan it around a sphere around an antenna because then you need to have some kind of armature, motorized armature with an antenna going around a test antenna on a on a uh, on a big sphere. That's a lot of mechanic, mechanical structures, right? Instead, you can do the same thing by having a fixed probe in space. So I have a fixed antenna here, and I take this antenna and I rotate it. So it's the same effect. I have the antenna measuring the probe here, and I rotate the antenna under test, which is the same thing as moving this probe around a fixed antenna under test. So then I just have to rotate this thing on some kind of pedestal. All right? So that's, that's how, you, how you do that. Okay. Pretty sure I have another example here. All right, here's another example of reciprocity. Impressed currents on PEC don't radiate. So that's the conclusion, we're gonna derive it. So by reciprocity, or what's also considered the reaction theorem, right? We have E1 dot with J2 is equal to E2 dot over J1 if there are no magnetic sources. All right, if M's are zero, then those terms go to zero. So we have this symmetric uh, product here or symmetric quantity, which is called a uh, reaction theorem. Okay, what is the problem? Here, we have PEC, sigma equal to infinity. <laughs> what I'm saying here is if I impress, mean I place an electric current near the PEC or on it even, then it will not radiate, all right? It radiates no field. You can almost think of it as uh, image theory. You can feel it that way. I put an electric current here, then it images across that PEC to the opposite direction. And these two radiate in free space, but they're so close together that they cancel out because they're 180 degrees out of phase. One way to kind of understand what's going on here, but we're going to derive in a different way. We have an impress J or, or okay, so uh, here, this is the problem. I have a J that I impress onto PEC and it radiates E2 equal to zero. It doesn't radiate. If you put an impressed current, means I place it into the medium, too close to a, a conductor, it won't radiate. All right? All right, so let's derive it. Since the sources are infinitesimal with uniform current, 
then these integrals can become just these dot products at these points because they're infinitesimal, like delta functions with uniform current. Therefore, E1 dotted with J2, E1 dotted with J2 is equal to E2 dotted with J1. And these are evaluated at R2, which is where source J2 is. And these are evaluated at R1, where source J1 is. Integrate over the source region. All right. Since E1 is tangent to PEC, so here's the, the symmetric system. We have E1 and J1. J1's at R1, and E1 is, a, is the radiated fields due to J1. And then we have e, J2 and E2, where E2 is at some position R, and J2 is at R2. So R1 is here, R2 is on the PEC. All right, since E1 is tangent to PEC, so here's the setup of the problem. E1 is tangent to this PEC at, at some position here, R, then we know that it is zero. So the left-hand side is zero, and zero then equals to E2 dotted with J1. We can choose the orientation and location of J1 arbitrarily, and the above must always remain true. So this can change positions arbitrarily oriented, and uh, the value of it can be arbitrary. Therefore, the field, which is the consequence of the current, has to be zero. So that means E2 is equal to zero, right? All right. If E2 is zero, then uh, by, by, this, by this symmetric setup here, then this current J2 that's near the PEC radiates no electric field. All right. Thus, any current source tangent to and resting on a PEC surface does not radiate any field whatsoever. Okay, that does not mean that PEC does not support electric current. We know that it does. If you have a plane wave impinging upon a PEC plane, then there will be a surface current induced, and that surface current radiates a reflected field, right? But if I impress an electric field onto it, or sorry, if I impress a, a current density onto it, then it doesn't radiate any fields, all right? That's the difference. This one is an impressed source. This one is an induced source, all right? Induced current, rather. Okay, good. All right. So let's now introduce reaction theorem. The reaction theorem says, we restate the reciprocity theorem here, right? We see that it does not relate quantities of power since no conjugates appear, right? Instead, the integrals measure the coupling between a set of fields and a set of sources, which produce another set of fields. So it measures the coupling. These integrals measure the coupling between a set of fields and a set of sources of which produce a different set of fields. All right, this coupling has been termed reaction. And we can write the above as the reaction of fields one with sources two is equal to the reaction of uh, fields two with sources one, where these, this notation, this, this bracket notation means a uh, functional inner product or these reaction integrals. Okay, the reaction theorem can also be expressed in terms of voltages and currents induced in one antenna by another. In general, that means that it can be written as ij is equal to vi I, uh, I into ji, right? So uh, is equal to ji into vi I, ij. So these are double indices here. So they're, it's the uh, current, so okay. Vi is the voltage of source i or or J, if this was a J. So it's the uh, voltage of some source I. And IIJ is the current through source J due to the source at I. All right, so uh, let me write it out. Let me draw a picture. So we have some source V, right? Say VI. And we have current through source J. So here's some source J, right? Uh, let me use I instead. I, okay. The current through this source due to the source at I. So there's some source here that gives rise to this voltage that, that radiates some field and then it'll drive a current through this, which is I, I, J. All right, let me see if I have a better picture on the next. Okay, here. So mutual admittance between two average antennas. We're going to use that result before 
in order to derive a very important result uh, or to calculate the mutual emittance between two different aperture antennas, right? Mutual emittance is one over the mutual impedance, right? So there are two antennas, a receiving antenna and a transmitting antenna. They're separated by a distance R, for example. And uh, in a two port network, so we have two port network parameters. The admittance parameters relate the current and the voltage, right? Just like impedance, net, impedance uh, parameters, the two port networks. Assuming that the voltage at all other ports is zero by definition of the admittance matrix, we can write that the current IIJ at port I due to the voltage at port J is uh, the following, right? IIJ is equal to uh, YIJ into VJ. All right. Uh, and then we have YIJ is equal to IIJ divided by VJ. But we know that IIJ is uh, VI or the integral functional inner product between I and J divided by VI, right? By reciprocity. Okay. So using the definition of the inner product for this term, we have YIJ is equal. So this is the mutual minutes between two different antennas. Ij over v, I, v, J. Let's express this in terms of its integral form. And then we're going to say that there's no electric current because it's an aperture antenna, all right? And aperture antenna has a time varying electric flux inside of, its, inside of an aperture, right? Inside of the mouth of the horn, for example. And that time varying electric current, time varying electric flux can be modeled as a magnetic current, but there's no metal conductors there to support an electric current. So, uh, so, okay, so it's magnetic current only. All right, there's a minus sign here. And we know that M can be found as negative N cross E. We'll get to that, right? That's how you can define M in terms of the aperture field E that's varying in time, right? Okay. And uh, so we can pull out this N here into make it into a DS and we can have H dotted with E or, or uh. Oh, we use, we use one of those back cab identities in order to get to this, this point here, all right? So what does it tell us? It says EJ is the electric field in aperture J with aperture I shorted. So it's the electric field in this aperture with this aperture shorted, for example. HI is the magnetic field at the shorted aperture due to excitation of aperture J, right? And VI is the voltage amplitudes at each aperture in the absence of the other. So it's, it's, it's a circuit picture of, it's a circuit picture of the reciprocity theorem or the reaction theorem. And you can use that in order to calculate the mutual minutes between two aperture antennas. So this is one way you can refer back to these slides if you're faced with a problem like this and try to solve it in this approach, right? Okay. All right, so it's, it's there, right? All right, so uh, where else is this used a lot? Okay, so I put this picture here. This is, I wonder if we're gonna go over this. Let me just see if we're gonna go over this. Yeah, all right, we'll go over this. We'll come back to that. All right, two more principles and then we're done, or three. So we have volume equivalence next. Volume equivalence is used, I use it in my moment method codes whenever I wanna calculate uh, the, you know, I wanna calculate the current that's induced in a dielectric medium. I'll show you that. So all right, well, here's the theorem setup. Assume that in free space, the sources Ji and Mi generate fields E0 and H0, all right? Free space, subscript zero, and the sources are Ji and Mi. They radiate E0, H0, so they must satisfy Max's equations, right? So we have curl of E0 is equal to minus Mi minus J omega mu0, H0, free space, mu0. Curl of H0, Ji plus J omega epsilon, not E0, yeah? So the sources Ji and Mi radiate E0 and H0. When the same source is Ji and Mi radiates in a medium represented by epsilon mu, so now these same sources I'm going to put in an infinite medium of epsilon and mu, not free space, then they generate a different set of fields, E and H, all right? Because the medium parameters are different. Same sources, different fields because the medium is different. These fields must also satisfy their own Maxwell's equations. So we have curl E, Ji and Mi radiates E and H, but now in a medium with mu, not mu naught and epsilon naught, epsilon naught, all right? Subtract these two results. And we can define what's called the scattered field, which we'll see in next lecture, what scattered field is formally, but scattered field is, uh, we're gonna define this quantity scattered field. We're gonna call it scattered field, but we'll understand what that means next lecture. But scattered field is equal to E minus E naught, 
the fields radiated by sources J and M I in medium epsilon mu minus the fields radiated by J and M I in free space. That gives you scattered electric field. Same thing for the scattered magnetic field. All right. So if we subtract these two results, we get the curl of E minus the curl of E naught. But we know the curl of E or E minus E naught is E scattered. So that's the curl of E scattered. On the left, we have minus these sources. They're common. They cancel out. And then we have uh, minus J omega mu minus mu naught into H and minus J omega mu naught H. Same thing with this, with the Ampere's law. All right. So what do we notice? We can almost make these look like Maxwell's equations for scattered fields, which say, what is the scattered field due to uh, some current density, right? We'll, we'll define an equivalent current density. But we almost have Maxwell's equations for scattered fields, and we want to calculate the scattered field. We'll see why. We, it's, it's, so what we're doing is we're calculating the field scattered by like a plane wave of a dielectric, uh, some kind of dielectric blob in space, dielectric cylinder, a square, whatever, right? Some dielectric region, I have a plane wave coming in, and it's going to scatter off. I want to solve that problem. What is the scatter field due to some dielectric medium or dielectric object? And there's a way to do it. So this is a Maxwell equation we can solve for that scatter field. But what is the source, right? So we know that Maxwell's equations normally say curl of ES minus J omega mu naught H, right? The displacement. And then there's usually a source term here, a current. Well, let's say that, let's look at this one. It's easier. Curl of H, and then we have this, and then some electric flux the, the displacement current, right? But here, this is normally a source J. So let's redefine this. Let's say that this is some equivalent current, J equivalent, as J omega epsilon minus epsilon naught into E. If we define that, then we can say that this is J equivalent. Then we have the curl of H equal to J plus J omega epsilon E, which is Maxwell's equation for scattered fields due to this current, the equivalent current, J equivalent. All right. Then the scatter field can be thought of as generated by some equivalent current J equivalent. Same with the magnetic field. Uh, the scatter field can be thought of as generated by this equivalent magnetic current. All right? Good. So we have a way now to calculate E scattered and H scattered from a dielectric object under some kind of illumination uh, if we can find what these equivalent currents are, M equivalent and J equivalent. But it's kind of a, it's so difficult because we need to know E and H, right? Which is the fields radiated by those sources in the infinite medium. All right. That's okay, though, because uh, I'll show you how it's still a useful theorem. So here's what I'm saying. I have the original problem here, the scatter field from a dielectric scatter. I have some kind of incidence to some object with epsilon r mu r and epsilon not mu naught outside, and it scatters the incident field. We'll define scattering next lecture. That's what we're going to study. But it scatters this incident field into uh, the, the incident region, right? So... These are the Maxwell's equations that tell you what the scatter field is due to this dielectric object. E scattered, H scattered are the solutions to these Maxwell's equations, but we need to know M equivalent and J equivalent. And then they're in, in turn uh, functions of the total electric field. All right. They're, in, they're functions of scatter field, really, and incident. Okay. But we'll see how we can still use this theorem. All right. So... What the theorem says is that this scattered field from an incident plane wave scattering off a dielectric object, the scattered field can be thought of as or can be found by you remove the dielectric object, which is very useful. That's the power of this. Because if I knew the currents in here, I'd still have to have a Green's function that could handle this dielectric object, radiation in the presence of the dielectric object, right? But by using this volume equivalence theorem, I remove the dielectric object. Everything is now mu naught epsilon, not everywhere. I can use free space Green's function that we know and love. And J equivalent, M equivalent are now just currents radiating in free space that exists only within this mathematical domain or boundary of which the original dielectric object was. These two currents radiate the scattered field. So I need these currents, right? If I have these currents, then I can find the scattered field, which is scattered off of a dielectric object. Super useful. How can we find those? Okay. So, okay, first thing, compare the expression for the equivalent current density, which are these, to the impedance boundary condition. I don't know if we've gone over this yet. I might have touched on it before. But by analogy, we can define a volumetric dielectric impedance. So here is for sheet impedances. E tangential is A to sheet J. This is like, you can think of it as um, uh, like E equal to sigma 
or j equal to sigma e, right? This impedance sigma is a conductivity. Okay, but this is a boundary condition for uh, impedance sheets that support a surface current j, and that current is related to the total electric field tangential to the surface to this constant called the surface impedance. Okay, compare these two. What you see is j is equal to j omega epsilon minus epsilon naught e, which is our j equivalent. If we divide both sides by this quantity, we have something similar. E is, e, e is equal to, is equal to, eta sheet into j, this quantity into j equivalent. We can call that eta v, some kind of volume equivalent, a volume impedance. All right. So now we've expressed the electric field we needed to find this current now in terms of some coefficients and, and the current itself. And we can use integral equations to solve. We can use integral equations then to solve for what this equivalent current should be, knowing this impedance. All right. OK, good. So introduction to volume equivalents, all right? Well, you have to see all these things at least once in order to have heard of them. Better if you study them so you can apply them in your research. All right, there are two more theorems. This one is by far the most important out of all of them that I've told you today. Image theory is pretty powerful, right? But this, this is by far the most important. Reciprocity is pretty cool too, but surface equivalence you'll use all the time. And the better you get at applying it, the more efficient you'll be at solving problems in electromagnetic theory. All right, so I'm gonna go slow and set this up, okay? We have A and B here. A shows sources J1 and M1 radiating fields E1 and H1 everywhere in a homogeneous medium of mu1 epsilon one. So there's no discontinuity in material parameters anywhere. This dashed line is what I'd call a mathematical surface that I can define in any shape I want that cuts through space and divides it into two regions or two volumes, right? But don't worry about that yet. The part A is I have sources J1, M1 radiating E1, H1 everywhere in the same medium, homogeneous medium. Okay. Now, all right. So we define this mathematical surface S that separates the medium into two regions, V1 interior to the surface and V2 exterior to the surface. So I have some surface S. I have V1 interior and V2 exterior. Okay. The next step is the primary task is to replace the original problem with an equivalent problem that will yield the same fields E1 and H1 outside of S. All right. So I have these sources. They radiate the fields everywhere, E1, H1. I cut this mathematical surface in space, right? Now, what I want is to find equivalent sources that reside on my mathematical surface that radiate the same E1, H1 outside of that surface. We don't care what's inside, all right? So here's the problem. I have some mathematical surface. I have mu1, epsilon1, mu1, epsilon1 still everywhere. And I find these equivalent currents M and J that exist on this mathematical surface I've defined. I remove the original sources. So now the problem has these equivalent sources. And these equivalent sources are set up such that they radiate outside of this surface into V2, the same E1 and H1 that these sources radiated. Inside, it can be whatever, right? We'll see a bunch of different uh, versions of this problem, depending on what we want to do with the inside, all right? So how is that useful? Okay. Uh, okay, so there's a bunch. This surface, first off, can be any shape I want. And I calculate these currents J and M using this formula, N cross H1 minus H, where H1 is the fields outside the original fields due to J1 and M1. And H is whatever I want to pick inside. I'm going to call it H. How do we know this is the right current? What does J do? What is the boundary condition for tangential H? From lecture one, do you remember? One of you guys must. It's, it's one, one thing I want you to remember in this whole course. Boundary condition for H, tangential. The difference is equal. Say? The difference between. Yeah? 
Okay, so so okay, so more formally, what do I write? N hat. N hat what? Oh, that's N hat, right? Yes. E one is that one? No, that that the very top I wrote N hat. Yes. What do I write for the boundary condition for the tangential H? E one. Okay. Cross. Yes, cross. That's correct. Okay, then what? E1 minus E. So it's for tangential H. E1 is, there is one for E, tangential E. But let's talk about tangential H. H1 or H2? So N points into medium one, so it's going to be H1, right? Yeah. Minus H2 equals to what? J. J what? S. Very good. All right. Okay. So yeah, these are important, all right? N cross H1 minus H2 is JS. That's the boundary condition for tangential H on, on uh, interfaces that support currents, right? They have to have infinite conductivity really, but all right. So what do we have here? We have J, this current is equal to N crossed with H1, the field outside minus H, the field inside. So J, it does a tangential discontinuity in H fields across an interface then there must be a current density to support that tangential discontinuity. In other words, if I have a current density on some surface or an interface, then it must therefore have, a, must uh, the, this, the uh, magnetic field must be discontinuous. The tangential magnetic field must be discontinuous because of the current, right? If I have H1 here and I have H2 here at two sides of an interface, then I know there has to be a current in between them. If there is a current sitting at some interface, then I know the magnetic field on either side is discontinuous, right? All right. So this is the correct current based on boundary conditions. So I have defined some mathematical surface in space. I apply the boundary conditions to that surface. That's all it is. So this is the boundary condition for J. This is the boundary condition for M. Yeah? Okay. So now what have I done? I've removed these sources. I don't need the sources inside anymore. And I just have a new problem with sources that are defined on some surface that radiate the same fields. This is tremendously useful. And it shows up a lot. Uh, we'll, we'll see some examples, all right? All right. So that's, okay, great. So by the boundary conditions, we learn, oh, so I have them here, I guess. I didn't look far enough. By the boundary conditions we learned in lecture one to support the discontinuity in the E and M fields or E and H fields, there exist surface current densities of the form J and M, all right, which radiate into unbounded homogeneous space. These current densities are said to be equivalent only within V2, since when the original source are removed, they will produce the original fields E1, H1 only outside of S. They produce a different field E and H within V1, all right? That's, that's a critical thing. All right, so let's see, there's different ways. Now we have the freedom, we can change E H inside, E and H inside. We can make it whatever we want because we're only interested in E1, H1 outside that was originally radiated by the original sources. So now I've gotten rid of these sources to find these new sources. And I still get from these original sources, I still get E1, H1 outside, which is what I want to find. But I have this control parameter E and H inside because I'm not interested in the fields inside. So I can make them whatever I want, right? It'll change these currents because they are functions of E and H which are the fields inside. So, but, but that doesn't matter. All right, so there are different choices. First choice is why not make them zero? All right, E and H zero inside. We can do that. So remember from the uniqueness theorem, the tangential components only, the tangential components of only E or H are needed. Hence, there are other possible forms of the equivalent problem. So by uniqueness theorem, we said we need only tangential E, over everything or tangential H over everything or part tangential E and part tangential H over the rest. All right, so since the fields within S are not of interest, the fields in here are not of interest. We want E1, H1 due to the original source or the equivalent sources. They give you the same fields. Then we could set them equal to zero. Then we have J into N cross H1, which was originally H1 minus H, but H is zero, so now it's N cross H1. And M was minus N cross E1 minus E, but E is zero. So now M is equal to minus N cross E. So now we have a simple form for these currents, J and M, right? All right, great. 
All right. This equivalence is referred to as love's equivalence principle. All right. Now, why choose zero? Okay, that made these currents different, but uh, it didn't help us calculate them or, or simplify the problem much, right? But now that there's zero electric field inside, I can place whatever I want inside of it, right? I can place uh, PEC inside. It's not going to change the problem because PEC in here gives me zero field. I know there's zero field in PEC and zero H, therefore, as well. Or I could put PMC inside, and I get zero fields inside still. Same problem. All these are equivalent. But what's useful if I put PEC there? If I fill it with PEC, we just saw on the last few slides that impress J on PEC does not radiate, right? So impress J on PEC does not radiate. If I fill it with PEC, the Js go away, and I only have Ms. So I can reduce the problem, the equivalent problem, to having only a magnetic current, M, and I can find E and H outside due to just M. Or if I have PMC by analogy or duality that we learned in the beginning of the lecture, impressed M on a PMC does not radiate, so I only need J. What's the problem that I have now, though? I've reduced it to having only M or J, but the problem is this remaining current, M or J, has to radiate in the presence of a conductor which means I can't use my free space Green's function in my vector potential integral. So this is still a problem, right? These currents, if I want to calculate the electric field radiated due to J, I would say, okay, let me set up my vector potential integration of J and the E to the minus J beta R over 4 by R, but the E to the minus J beta R over 4 by R is not the right Green's function for occurrence in the presence of a conductor. So I need to somehow get back to free space here. All right, what we're going to do is assume that the, uh, so this is called Shulkinoff's, Shulkinoff's equivalence principle, when M is equal to zero or J is equal to, these are Shulkinoff's, this is Love's, all right? All right, I need to get rid of the conductors. What do you guys think I should do? See if you can use your theorems that we've learned in this lecture. How do I get rid of the conductor? What are all the ways we've gotten rid of conductors using these theorems? What? Very nice, good job. Let's assume that it's a conductor or this metallic conductor is big. Locally, it's planar. Uh, we're gonna use uh, image theory. All right, so now we have M for this problem. M radiating in the presence of a conductor, right? In the presence of PEC. What do we do? Well, we can use image theory. I know what the image of M is across PEC infinite plane. It's in the same direction. So now I have these two M's, which are infinitesimally close to this conductor, and I can remove the conductor. Now these two M's are radiating in free space. They're so close together that I can just double one of them. So I have two M's, and I'll just have two M, negative two N cross E1 is my M now, and that radiates in free space or in the same homogeneous medium. I can use my free space Green's function vector potential approach now to calculate the fields radiated by... Uh, these surface currents residing on some kind of um, surface. Good. So let's do this quick example. I went through this. I wanted really this to drive home and hit hard with you guys. So I took the time to, to write up this example and figure it out, right? And do a numerical solution shows that it works. So here, let's do something we know, right? Some sources we know, a problem we know, we can solve analytically. Here we have Epsilon naught mu naught, epsilon naught mu naught. I have a sphere, so the service has to be easy for us, symmetric for us to do it analytically. And I have source J1, which is a dipole. We already know the fields due to a dipole from last lecture. All right, V1 and V2 surface S define, separates these two volumes. E1 is the fields due to a dipole. H1 is the fields due to the dipole, which is this current in the center of this, right? Okay, I want to find the equivalent currents on S. The equivalent surface currents on S for Love's equivalence principle where I say the interior fields are equal to zero, are Js n cross H1 and Ms n negative n cross E1. I know what H1 is. I know what E1 is. I can find Js and Ms on surface S, right? Okay, good. These fields, due to these sources, can be found using the vector potential approach from last lecture. Now I know everything's in free space because I'm saying the fields are zero inside. The currents that are on the surface S will radiate the original E1 and H1 outside of S, these fields outside of S, and zero field inside of the 
inside of S. These currents will. So A is equal to mu over 4 pi, integration of the surface. This J, which is N cross H1, e to the minus J bar over R. F, because we also have magnetic currents, that's the, dis that's the disadvantage of using Love's equivalents. I have to solve for A and F. Whereas if I use Shulkinoff, then I only need A or F, but then I need image theory and double it. So that's just a factor of two. But anyway, epsilon over 4 pi, M e to the minus J bar over 4 pi R, right? And then I have E is E due to A and E due to F. I have to add them together. I have E and H, right? So I did all of this in MATLAB and in console. All right. So first thing we need to do is find what J and M are. J is N cross H evaluated at R equal to A on the surface. M is negative N cross E evaluated on the surface. We know what H and E are from the field due to a dipole. They're here. We specialize these to R equal to A, R equal to A. And we have the currents, right? What you can do then is you can take those currents and you can uh, plug them into the vector potential and you get the fields here. Equivalent current on one lambda shell. This is the electric far field in MATLAB radiated using the vector potential on the last slide due to these currents J and M in the blue curve. Then I also plotted the actual dipole, the fields due to the dipole at the origin. So the red curve is the electric magnetic field radiated by a dipole. The blue curve is the electric and magnetic field radiated by surface currents on a sphere. And they're exactly the same by equivalence, surface equivalence. All right. And then here is the uh, azimuthal plane. Now, what's okay? So I took these currents that are defined on the surface of a sphere and I put them in COMSOL, which is an electromagnetic simulation software for the parameters F equal to 10 gigahertz. A was a one lambda sphere. So the one, radi one lambda radius sphere, the current I is equal to one amp. For that, for that, and the delta Z of that current is lambda over 50. All right. Anyway, for those, I calculate JS and MS. I put JS and MS on the surface of a sphere in COMSOL. From this analytic formula, I plugged into Maxwell or into COMSOL, and then I, I put that on the surface of a sphere. Now, then I calculated using COMSOL, finite element solver, what the radiated fields are due to these surface currents on the surface of a sphere. And what do we get? We get the same fields outside due to the dipole. But what's amazing is those surface currents on that sphere all conspire. The radiation due to this current here and this part of the current here and the, this part of the current, the electric and magnetic currents on the surface of a sphere somehow all radiate fields. They're all radiating fields, but they all add up out of destructively. They all add up to zero everywhere in the sphere, zero everywhere in here. When I first saw this, I couldn't stop thinking about it for like, I dreamed about it. Couldn't stop thinking about it because it's like a numerical verification. Somehow all these surface currents are conspiring to give a perfect zero field everywhere inside. How can you have some surface currents that perfectly conspire and add up together everywhere inside of a sphere to give you zero at all points? Those are in incredible surface currents, right? They radiate some, they radiate the exact field here, 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 every point in the volume together to give you zero. So that's Love's equivalence theorem right there, right? Zero inside, you get the same radiated fields outside as the dipole in the original problem. So yeah, pretty cool. Everywhere zero, not approximate, exactly. Zero everywhere. Blue is zero, yeah, here's the scale. So it's like 10 to the minus three and there's 120 red. So immediately, it's, it's pretty cool. Like everywhere, it's exactly zero everywhere inside. If you ever try to set up an experiment where you have two sources that, a set of sources that radiate a particular set of fields, let it be not zero even, but zero if you want, that, that's really hard to define. Actually, there's a paper by George Eleutheriotis at the University of Toronto where he has kind of these rings of dipoles, uh, you know, rings of sources around some region, and he's able to create any field inside he wants by properly designing or sourcing all of these dipoles. If you guys are interested in this type of thing, uh, but it's a cylinder. It's very sim similar though. It's really cool, but it's a hard problem to solve, right? So this, this numerical, this numerical solver would solve Max's equation numerically exactly gives you zero everywhere. So that's Love's equivalence principle, right? Here's Love's equivalence is these surface currents, if I can place them on this surface and let them radiate, Give me the E1H1 outside of the original sources inside, 
And they give me exactly zero everywhere inside, all the way up to the boundary and everywhere in between. And here's numerical proof of that. Right here. Okay, what do we have next? We just have physical optics, two slides. We'll start those next lecture, all right? Okay, good. All right, you have another homework out, uh, start it. And your project, if you wanna do that, you should start at least trying to get the software and uh, learning the software. Pick a paper, pick an easy one, make it easy for yourself, but learn something. And uh, I will see you guys. Uh, we have two lectures next week and then Thanksgiving break, right? So, all right, see you on Tuesday. What is the name of the paper that you mentioned? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I think it's called a Huygens box. Sweet. Huygens box. Elif, Derry, Otis. I know I didn't spell that right. Yeah, I think it, that's what he's calling it. Yeah. Alex Wong was his student. Active Huygens box. From here, you can get follow the reference path or the reference trail, and you can get to like your first paper on it from their group, University of Toronto. It's really cool. Yeah, we'll check it out. Maybe I can use it. For yeah, that would be awesome. That'd be really, really cool. Okay. Uh, let's see. It's probably with an electronically controlled meta service. Yeah, so he's able to change the uh, electronically reconfigure the meta surface around the perimeter and change, create any electromagnetic field he wants within the within the box. Yeah, the other paper that you um, I think that you posted online in the canvas was a, about anisotropic media. They have some simulation or something. Uh, and as, oh, you mean uh, Professor Gerbic, Anthony? University of Michigan and Huracan, I think. I don't remember. Was this one talk about was anisotropic? The, yeah. Yeah, that's a cool paper too. Okay. Yeah, that's anisotropic medium, phase and tailoring the phase and power flow. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a good paper. And they have simulation in that paper? Or uh, the yeah, paper? yeah, they have simulations. Okay. okay, we check it out. Yeah, let me know. Yeah.